Hi everybody, we're going to continue with our Unit 2 lessons on craft and collectivity with um, a little bit of a discussion of Faith Ringgold. You'll see in your readings, I have some materials available about Faith Ringgold, and I wanted to just take you through some images by her now. She's one of my favorites. This is her. She was born in 1930. She fits into what we've been talking about in a few ways. For one thing, she was part of that whole kind of second wave feminism moment. Uh, most of her work was in that period, or that's not true actually, she's been working her whole life, but the work that kind of put her on the map was um, started in that 1960s, 1970s period where a lot of women artists were trying to embrace craft as a way to just point out the inequities associated with craft and the way that craft was always sort of downplayed because it was associated with women. She was born in Harlem and she began her career as a painter. So I thought I'd show you a few of her paintings, which are pretty great, mostly from the late 60s. Pretty political paintings, very graphic, not graphic like bloody, although this one is, but I mean graphic like very clear. I love this one. This just seems like a lot of fun and it's called Party Time, which is perfect. So um, again, she started her career as a painter. Her mom was a fashion designer. So she was somebody who had a lot of just like understanding of textiles and things like that because of her mother. Um, she went to community college, like all of us um, in New York City. And then she ended up teaching in the public schools in New York for a while. She ended up being a founding member of a collective. Remember, we've been talking about collectives a lot in this unit. The collective was called Where We At, or WWA. Um, and it was a group of Black women artists who got together in 1971 to write about each other's work and to organize their own exhibits. This was a way to just make sure that they were supporting each other since so much of the art world was just ignoring women and then a lot of the feminist art world was ignoring or marginalizing black women and so this was a way that black women artists could at least showcase each other's work so by banding together in that way they were able to get a little bit more attention in their work it wasn't a collective in the sense that they collaborated on their art i know we've seen some things like that it was more of a collective in the sense that they just wrote about each other's art So in the 1970s is when she switched from painting to quilts. This is a fairly early one. It's early 80s. This one called Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima is a story quilt. She has become really well known for these. By story quilt, I mean that they involve some kind of storytelling through words. So if you look here, I know it kind of just looks like texture. Let me see if I can zoom. I can't zoom on this, but um, this is words and then it goes with the pictures and in this particular one the panels with words are numbers and they kind of match with the images so you can kind of read your way through the story which is cool just so you can see the size of it here's michelle wallace who is a really great critic and um she's like a cultural critic philosopher type and she's faith ringle's daughter so I always think that's neat that we have multi-generational people who are really influential in the arts that we can look at. Um, I mean, she did write about all kinds of things, but she also wrote about art and popular culture. But here she is in front of her mom's quilt. It's bigger than it looked in this picture. I think you could actually use it as a quilt, although I imagine nobody did because you wouldn't want to mess it up. We have been looking at quilts a little bit in this class already. And Faith Ringgold was very aware of this tradition that African-American women had in terms of using quilts to communicate. Remember when we talked about Harriet Powers, we talked in part about how as an enslaved woman, at least in her early life, she wouldn't have had much access to books and to learning how to read. And so she ended up creating narratives through images like this one, which includes some biblical imagery as well as some celestial imagery that seemed to be a favorite of hers. Faith Ringgold was thinking about people like Harriet Powers when she was making quilts like this. Of course, she includes words, but the storytelling element is consistent in both. Remember, we also talked about the quilt codes idea, and that was quite controversial. A lot of scholars think that it's a myth. Some think it's real, but it just didn't get 
to be part of the historical record in an official way because it's word of mouth. But either way, just the idea of people communicating with each other secretly through symbols and quilts would have been something that Faith Ringgold was thinking about when she made these quilts and something that was consciously part of a tradition um, of African-American women that went back really far. And of course, Annie Mae Young's work clothes quilt is another interesting comparison. Remember, Annie Mae Young was part of the G's Ben painting group, or not painting, sorry, the G's Ben quilting group. Um, and they were a collective of African-American women who were basically living in the same land that had been a plantation where their ancestors had been enslaved. So there's this really interesting dynamic there, but they ended up really having a distinctive local quilt style which is quite beautiful and abstract and feels a lot like the abstract paintings that we're selling for a lot of money, um, mostly from European painters or from American painters from big cities. So Faith Ringgold's work is quite different than this, but it's still part of this tradition. She's probably thinking about all of these things. Here's one that I just think is really lovely. She ended up doing a lot of portrait quilts where she would paint so the inside panel is painted and then the rest is quilted and the text is embroidered this one is a portrait of maya angelou and then the writing talks about her it's like a biography and i think it includes quotes from her too so she calls it maya's quilt of life she did a lot of really beautiful portraits of african-american women um, through these quilts some of them are kind of like diaristic so here's one called over 100 pound weight loss performance story I don't know all the details about this one, um, but clearly it is personal. And just the idea of showing these nude women in a pretty honest way, you know, not idealized. They're not presenting themselves sexually in any way. They're just kind of standing around. I always think that is interesting, particularly these three who seem to just be kind of like, you know, smiling with each other. And of course you have her writing element. And again, this part's painted. The middle part panel is painted and then you have the quilted squares and then you have the written element, which is embroidered. The series that art historians always love most is called the French Collection because they're just full of references to art history. So this is a series where she kind of imagines this woman, an African-American woman um, who she names Willa. And Willa is basically time traveling through France and going and seeing different kind of art hotspots in France during the modernist period. So she doesn't, Faith Ringgold doesn't really worry about like creating an exactly historically accurate situation. She's more just sort of imagining this African-American woman kind of transported into these different places. This particular one is just sort of lovely and pleasant. You see this black family, all women here, dancing and having fun in the Louvre. Behind them are three paintings by Leonardo da Vinci. And even though the mood here is really light, it's pretty hard to ignore that all of the women in the paintings behind are white women. And these black women and girls who are having fun in the museum really aren't going to see themselves reflected in a dignified way anywhere in this museum. There might be images of black people, but they're going to most likely be really motivated by a kind of colonial gaze. Um, and so, you know, we've seen some work like that in the class where black people and brown people and basically anybody but white Europeans are kind of dehumanized in imagery. And so we can just imagine that that's what they're going to experience if they see themselves reflected at all. And yet they still dance together and have a good time and move in this space in a way that we're kind of not supposed to. You know, you're supposed to be so solemn in a museum and you can see them refusing that. More common, though, in the French Collection series are things like this, where you see specific references to artworks from the modernist period. Here's Van Gogh with his flowers in the background. You probably know that sunflowers painting by Van Gogh, but in case you don't, here's one of them. He did a number of paintings of sunflowers. There's Van Gogh himself. And you can see here, you have all of these African-American women, and they're all specific people Harriet Tubman's in here. Um, let me remember who else. Oh, their names are escaping me right now, but um, various important women from Black history are sitting here. Oh, there's Surgeon or Truth. Remember we read her speech, Ain't I a Woman? Um, 
but anyway, here they are all sitting together and you see they're quilting together. They're all from different time periods. Some overlap, but this is a fantasy. They wouldn't have actually been together. But they're having a quilting bee. So just as we talked about that collectivity that's so common in craft, we see them here all working together, making this sunflower quilt. And Van Gogh, who got famous for his modernist sunflowers like this, is kind of in the background, you know, I think being deferent. He's bringing them flowers. He seems to respect what's happening here. So it's kind of a nice meditation on how much differently artists like Van Gogh were treated than artists like the women who made quilts. But you see Van Gogh here almost kind of acknowledging that, which I think is nice. And I don't know if you know this about Van Gogh, but he really wanted to be in a collective. He tried to form an artist commune. He really wanted to work with others. And it just didn't end up working out for him for a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons was that the idea of the individual genius working alone and suffering alone was quite important during that period. And so I think he would have wanted what these women had, but he was sort of stuck working alone um, and fitting into that role of the individual as genius rather than the collective. Remember, we talked about how much that ends up being gendered, that women are understood to be more of a collective and then men are seen to be individuals just in the history of art. And here's a few more from the French collection. This one, which is called Joe Baker's Birthday, um, is referencing Josephine Baker, who was an American woman who ended up going to France and having a pretty exciting dynamic life working as a dancer who was super involved with music and art scenes um, that were formed by African-American expatriates. So African-Americans who had left and were living in Paris where they had a little bit more freedom from um, the systemic racism that was in the United States. Here in the corner, some of you might recognize that. That's a reference to this painting by Matisse. So again, referencing modernism. Another really great one. Here we have our time traveler again, Willa. And she's appeared in Picasso's studio. Here's Picasso. Right behind her, you probably recognize that, but in case you don't, it's this painting, which was considered to be this big breakthrough for Picasso. People saw this as being the first Cubist painting, Cubism's an art movement. And this was seen as really revolutionizing painting by having all these kind of broken shards and thinking of space as something you can kind of break down and rearrange. But one thing that is true about Picasso is that he didn't completely invent this. That kind of geometric look was something that had been present in African art for a really long time. And he was kind of obsessed with African art at this time. You can see in the background these masks, African and Oceanic art objects that he was collecting. And we even have a photo of him in his studio with these various African objects behind him. So, you know, with time, people have kind of recognized Picasso isn't the individual genius who came up with this idea of geometric abstraction. He was just influenced by something and then he integrated it in a good way. And that doesn't make him less important or make his work less valuable, but it just changes the narrative. It makes him as part of a kind of collective rather than that individual genius who just comes out of something out of the blue that we, um, that we like to tell. That story of, you know, somebody standing alone in their studio, you know, being tortured and brooding and thinking by themselves and then having a breakthrough idea. Instead, they're studying African art and integrating influences. So of course, there's lots of things about gender and race kind of tied up in this painting. I think I have some writing on this painting for you in your readings. Um, so there's more to it, but I don't want to keep this video going too long. Definitely read a little bit more about it. Okay, that's where we're going to pick up next. So that's our little bit on Faith Ringgold. Remember, she relates to this unit in a number of ways. She founded a collective. She was a founding member, at least, of a collective. She definitely meditates on the differences between craft and art, and particularly in this sunflower quilting bee and the Picasso quilt, all of the French connection, French collection quilts. She's really speaking to the way that modernist painting kind of made that narrative of the individual male genius working alone and she tries to undermine that and show how much it's more complicated and show what the what the kind of, I guess, the effect or the implications of thinking about 
African-American collective quilting traditions would have on the way that we see people like 